You might want to turn your Bibles to the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 23. We'll have reason to refer to that, Joshua 23, although I won't be reading all of what we want to look at there. That's where we will be located. Joshua, at the time of what happens in chapter 23, as the scripture says in verse 1, is old and well stricken in years. King James reads, waxed old and stricken in age. But that's the way, the first time I said it, the way we'd say it now, at least I think we would. The children of Israel are reminded how they got possession of the land of Canaan. I think it's important to understand, though we refer to it pretty often, how we, because of what we are as humans, need to be reminded of good things. And when you read the history of Israel, from the time they leave Egypt, their 40 years of wandering, and why they wandered in the wilderness until all died but Joshua and Caleb, 20 years old and upward. And then you read through Joshua and the time of the judges, all the way through their history, they had very short-term memory. They just did not stay with what they would promise to do. So they were reminded why they were in that land in the first place. It was because they were faithful to God, and thus God gave it to them. There's an interesting point here that refutes a modern-day false doctrine that is much believed, and I've made reference to it several times in the last week or so. The idea that once a person is saved, he's always saved. There's not a thing he or she can do one way or the other to lose their salvation. We commonly refer to it as once saved, always saved. But notice that even back here at this time in the Old Testament, it's not true that once God's people possessed God's blessings, that they always possessed them regardless of what they believed or what they did or did not do. The promises and the blessings of God upon his people have always been conditional. That's something that the whole religious world that says God's our Father and Christ's our Savior and the Bible's the Word of God for the most part just does not get. It's there. They can read it. But they have embraced human doctrines of several hundred years ago, and in order to make the Bible support it, then they simply don't see it. Israel, though saved out of Egypt by the great hand of God and their faith in Moses, a type of Christ, as Paul would say, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they escaped that punishment, that is, their slavery, a type of being enslaved to sin for all men today, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. We need a Savior. Thus, that was typified way back there. Well, they weren't long until they transgressed God's will. And as I said in the beginning, all those 20 years old and upward died in the wilderness wandering except Joshua and Caleb. And thus we read of them as they, they go on. And they are able to reach the land of Canaan, promise them through their faithful compliance with the will of God. But that didn't mean they would always be there. Read Deuteronomy. Moses tells them, even he couldn't go because he violated God's will, that if you go into this land and you do not keep the covenant, God will move you off of it, just like he's going to use you to take the Canaanites out. 
their being able to enjoy the promised land was totally dependent upon their faithfulness to God. The promises and blessings of God upon his people then, I reiterate and I give great emphasis to, are conditional. And I think you can see this great truth is needed today just as it was during Joshua's day. So I'd like for us to learn some lessons from Joshua chapter 23, 1 through 13. But before I do that, we must realize in the Lord's church, otherwise I've been talking about people outside the Lord's church who try to claim Jesus as Savior. But we need to realize that once we're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered us, we're then made free from sin, Paul says, Romans 6, 17 and 18. That form of doctrine is seen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. That that doesn't mean because we've been baptized for the remission of sins and done it from the heart. That we can just do anything we want to do any way we want to do it or not do it. And we'll still remain saved. It just doesn't. I've seen people over my years preaching in places, especially when... In the smaller towns, I would visit the hospitals, and in those days, they would have a, a book up front, and they would have listed there all of the people in the churches that they said they were affiliated with. And I don't know how many people over the years I've visited that had Church of Christ out by their name, and you go visit them. You didn't know who they were, and you know how it is in small towns. People tended to know, or the people in the church where you worked as the preacher would know of these folks. Maybe been there several years. Nobody knew who they were. And invariably with many of them, you would talk to them. They'd say, oh, I've been baptized. But they hadn't darkened the door of a church building to worship God or be active in the church or to be members of a given congregation of the Lord's people. But they they have been baptized. I want to say this before moving on. Baptism will do only what God said it would do. It's not a marriage ceremony. It doesn't take the place of worshiping. It doesn't take the place of Bible study. It doesn't take the place of prayer. It doesn't take the place of practicing pure and undefiled religion, James 1 and 27. Baptism does one thing. If you have fully believed in Christ properly, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in Him, then it remits all your past sins. God forgives you. And Jesus adds you to the church. Acts 2, verse 47, Acts 2, 38. That's what it does. Now, if you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that's being faithful, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, then the blood of Christ continues to cleanse you, 1 John 1, verse 7. But I've seen too many times people look out at the denominational world and say, you people are wrong in believing that a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost, and then turn right around and uh, practice it themselves not being too interested or involved in the work of the church or the work of the family of God as a child or brother or sister in Christ. Well, what's the difference? If there's any difference at all, the true member of the church who acts that way ought to know far better than the person outside of Christ who doesn't know the plan of salvation or what it means to be truly converted. So there's a lesson here for the person outside of Christ as to how to become a Christian. And there's a lesson here for members of the church concerning being faithful once you've been baptized for the remission of sins and the Lord's added you to the church. Now, notice what we learned then in Joshua 23, 1 through 13. And I'm not claiming all of these are the only things you can learn from this, but there's some, some important ones. God reminded Israel... And I've already said this, but I'll say it again, again, and again. That it was he and he alone who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 20, 
and verse 2 in Exodus 13 and verse 3. Now, if you want to see it repeated over and over again, just go through Deuteronomy. Now, that's a restatement of the law by Moses just before Moses leaves them and Joshua takes them to possess the land of Canaan. He will remind them over and over again the power that held them as slaves had to be broken down or destroyed before they could even begin their journey to the promised land. And that was done by the plagues in Egypt and by them following Moses and passing through the Red Sea by God's power. But again, and Paul uses this in writing to the Corinthians, saying plainly that though they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, Moses is a type of Christ. Not with all of them was God pleased. And so you have all of those dying in the wilderness. So our salvation today must be secured by past deliverance. There's no use trying to live the Christian life if you have not gained remission of past sins, the very <laughs> sins that alienated you from God in the first place. We don't realize it because sin is glamorized today. But sin is a very cruel taskmaster for all people at all times. The main thing is it, it's the only thing that separates a person from God. That's what is meant in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. I won't read it now, but Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Isaiah is making that very clear long before the church was established to God's people. So all accountable people must be delivered from sin's grip before they begin the journey of being a Christian in the family of God. It was by the grace, the favor of God, as Paul wrote in Romans 5, 8, that he commendeth his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, redemption is possible to all, everybody, through our Lord's shed blood, according to Paul in Ephesians 1 and verse number 7. But first, one must obey the gospel, which is God's power to save you, Romans 1.16. The one desiring to be set free from the bondage of sin will act upon his or her belief in God's Word, which belief was created itself in understanding the Word of God. But it will lead you then also to repent of your sins and obeying that commandment of Acts 17, 30, or as Jesus taught it in Luke 13, 3 and 5. There will be the confession to prove your belief before men that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then the very entry point into the kingdom, the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, is being immersed by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. Paul, a believer, as Saul of Tarsus, and by his actions proving his repentance, when the gospel preacher found he was a believing, penitent person, said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The water didn't do it, but his faith in God and being buried with Christ in baptism, baptized into his death where Christ shed his blood, then that's when his sins were remitted, Romans 6 and verse 4. And those who are baptized into Christ should realize that on true, upon true repentance, what, what it is, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer serve sin or be in bondage to sin, Romans 6 and verse 6. You know, you, you're baptized into Christ. You're buried with Christ in baptism. You bury a dead man. You don't bury a live man. 
And a person dies to the habitual purpose practice of sin when one repents of sin, Acts 17.30. Thus you can be baptized into the death of Christ because you're buried with him. The world round about us says you're saved the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience. So they're very alive, man. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. And that will be our judge regardless of how many millions of people teach otherwise. The Romans 6 and verse 6 makes it clear that when you rise from the water to the grave of baptism, you are a new creature in Christ. And one cannot go to heaven who refuses to be set free from the bondage to sin, which is our sins that originally alienated us from God and caused us to have need of a Savior. Now look at Israel's possession, the land that God gave them. It was to be kept. It wasn't just given to them. It said, do as you please. If you look at denominationalism today, it says, do as you please, whatever suits you, as long as you say Christ is the Son of God and you claim He is Savior, and you go to heaven. Churches founded by men allow for just about anything and everything to be believed and practiced. And many things the Bible obligates one to do, they ignore it. <clears throat> That's because they don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. Or they don't respect the authority of the Bible that they're to rightly divide. And they don't have the proper understanding of the place of the Lord's church in the salvation of men. They don't understand if you go back to the first century and they take the Bible and the Bible only and they read about the church being established in Acts chapter 2, that that was just the Lord's church. Well, was there a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox? wasn't there. They came later on when people left the truth and began to do as they pleased, which we were warned about in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in a latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience here at the hot iron, forbidding to marry and to abstain from meats, and so on and so forth. Some of the early departures were mentioned in the verses to follow. So first God told his people that there must not be any going back to the land of Egypt. You remember in the wilderness wandering, the people at times when things got tough, they said, oh, if we could be back there eat, eating the food that was supplied to us. Well, they seem to have forgotten how terribly uh, their life was as slaves and how they were abused. That tells me something about me and you and every other human being. It's awful easy once we get out from under something and remember back how it was to forget just what a tough time it was. Have you ever noticed how we'll talk about the good old days? <laughs> how it used to be so much better? Every generation as it got older has always done that. They've always looked back and said it used to be better. I was visiting one time with the late G.K. Wallace, and we were, he was in a meeting with us, and we were at somebody's house eating. We were talking about things like that. He was sitting at the end of the table, and he said, he was in his mid-70s. I'm older now than he was then, but he was in his mid-70s. <laughs> After people had talked about the good old days and how it used to be so much better, blah, 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 he just spoke up and said, I have found that those days talk a whole lot better than they lived. That's what's wrong with the children of Israel. They can't remember the whip. They can't remember being forced to do things they were hardly physically able to do. They just remember what good things they could, rem could think about. That can happen to every one of us. And when we do that in the wrong way about the wrong things, then we think, well, maybe being a Christian is not all it's cracked up to be. And that's no good. So there can't be any going back to Egypt. And there's too many people that want to go back to Egypt, figuratively speaking. Listen to what's said in verses 12 and 13 of Joshua 23. He says to them, else if you do at all go back, 
and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you. And notice what he says. We would say it this way. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. No, he says, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive these nations from out of your sight. But they shall be a snare and a trap unto you and a scourge in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Again, Joshua 23, 12, 13. Now, what's he saying? If you begin to compromise, if the law of Moses ceases to be that important to you and you don't follow it, then you're going to get mixed up with the, with the worldly crowd. I have seen a lot of people think that they can go out with a worldly bunch who cares nothing about God or the Bible, participate in all their worldliness, and then tell us they're doing it so they can teach them the gospel. I've seen that among churches. There's, even today, certain places where they go to the bar and they have the bar church where they sit down at the tables and drink beer and study the Bible. You know how people used to read this about children of Israel and say, how could they do that after having gone through all they did and getting out of Egypt and what all they saw? Well, how could people today claim to be members of the church of our Lord and children of God, members of the body of Christ, and then go out and say, we're going to teach the Bible to a bunch of folks in a bar participating in all that they do? We're not much different from these folks, generally speaking, in the way we depart from the truth. Children of God today must not return to the principles that govern those who live by worldly standards. And that's how you sum up what is being said by Joshua to these children of Israel. The old man that we're supposed to have crucified and put to death, and his worldly ways, of course, should have been buried. And they will remain buried unless you dig them up. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I think the warning by the writer, the inspired writer of the Hebrews epistle could not be more clear and to the point. He says, take heed, brethren. If I were to say to you today, there is a rattlesnake loose in here. It's pretty small. Take heed. What would you think take heed meant? You know, maybe there is one. What, do you kind of feel it going around your feet? Don't you want to look down and see? Right. <laughs> ah, it's amazing what you can do when you suggest that because most of you want to look down, but you know I want to, and psychologically you want to, but you won't. <laughs> so the point is when you say take heed, pay attention, then that's what it means. Take heed, brethren. Notice what they're to take heed to. Lest haply there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Oh, I can know if I have an evil heart of unbelief. I can know when I'm moving away. I can know when I'm becoming worldly and the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life is beginning to dominate me. Take heed, brethren, lest haply there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, he says that to people who have belief. I don't know how people can read that and say, well, they never believed in the first place. But they did. And they're told to keep that belief, to build it up. That's what edification of the church means. Then he says, in falling away from the living God. You can't fall from grace. He says you have an obligation to keep yourself in a position so you will not fall away from the living God, Hebrews 3.12. And one cannot fall from where he has not been. You can't fall off this roof unless you're up there in the first place. So it's the responsibility of the Christian not to return and feed on worldly pastures. Next of all, fleshly Israel was not to have any fellowship with the enemy. <laughs> 
Joshua's warning to the people, I think, is quite clear. I'll read some of it, verses 6 and 7, and I'll drop down to verses 12 and 13. Notice what he says to them, reading from the American Standard Version, 1901. Turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Come not among these nations, these that remain among you. Neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them. Neither serve them, nor bow down yourselves unto them. What better way to say have not one thing in the world to do with them? Then he says, else if you do at all go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, here again, we're reading what we've already said, but for emphasis, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive these nations from out of your sight, but they shall be a snare and a trap unto you and a scourge in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which Jehovah your God hath given you. Can it be clearer? Knowing that was written aforetime, for we who are Christians today, not just for them. Because fleshly Israel is a type of spiritual Israel. So the message is quite clear and pointed. When the Israelites mingled with the Canaanites, it never improved the Canaanites. Have you noticed that? It never improved the Canaanites. It always, in every case, brought misery upon God's people. The idea that Christians have to run with the world in order to reach worldly people for the cause of Christ comes from one source. That's the devil. No other source. The Bible teaches no such thing. One is not going to win over a person who drinks alcoholic beverages by going with him to the clubs and the bars. One's not going to convert those entangled in the sins of the flesh by attending the kind of parties that they throw. To please God and to reach the law or whoever is erring as a member of the church with the truths of God, one must always Come out from among them and be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. To do otherwise is simply to fail. Well, as we bring the lesson to a close, we simply conclude that the Christian must continue to walk in the light. That's the light of truth. That's the light of what it is to be faithful to God as a Christian. It's the only way that heaven will be our home, 1 John 1, 7. There's just no other way. Now, this lesson, somebody else might have presented it in a more simple way, and by that I mean so the person that wanted to could easily understand it. But I don't think many could because it's so simple to get. You cannot live like the world and be spiritual. You cannot live like the world and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You cannot live like the world and walk the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. Simply put, you can't be worldly and go to heaven. Read Galatians 5 and look at the works of the flesh. Christians have no partner lot with that. They crucify those things themselves. That's of the old man. They don't go back and visit them. They don't want to go back to Egypt. And so we labor day by day to keep ourselves walking toward heaven by following the truth of God, always bringing our minds in subjection to the truth of God, for that's how you're faithful. That's how you get there. If you're not a child of God this morning, if you listened to what I had to say and opened your Bible, you would see that we've studied what it takes to become a Christian. How the old man dies to sin and how one becomes a new creature in Christ. And then as a new creature in Christ, the importance of being faithful. Even if it costs you your life to be faithful to Christ, you will 
and then receive a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. That's what it's all about. This world's quickly passing away. For some of us, there can't be many more years. And yet for all of us, regardless of how young, James says it's like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Some of you that are only in your late teens or in your 20s or whatever, I'm telling you, someday you're going to remember that old Brother Brown stood here after he's been gone for years and said, well, age would be here and here it is. It has a way while you're young, you don't think about it. And then before you know it, you're an old codger. If God blesses you long enough to grow old. Now, I've preached this since I was a teenager, just like I preach it now. Because I had no more assurance that I would see 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 or 45 or 50. But I know by reason of common sense that at my age there can't be many more years left. And yet even then, the Lord may come back before this day is over. The main thing is, is to love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, all that you have and are. Love your neighbor yourself. Have a love that always obeys God, John 14, 15, because that's the only kind of love that lasts anything. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray to God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the truth, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.